You're listening to the most fraudulent F1 podcast with Dan, aka Engine Mode 11. I secretly moonlight as Helmut Marco at race weekends. And Blake, aka Break. Echo chambers of farts and idiots on Twitter after races. It's the Engine Breaking F1 podcast. Boom, episode nine. Get it up here. Go on, lad. Go on, lad. Right up there. Yeah. 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 Go on. How are we doing? Some, yeah, we're good. We've had some banging guests the last two episodes, <laughs> and now we're going to lower the tone again by having it just me and you. Yeah. I mean, we had um, one of my favorite Formula One content creators, F1 Tony, a.k.a. Tony Cohen Brown. And then last week, uh, the um, my brother from another mother, uh, Connor Daly, joined us for an episode after running into him in the paddock again in Austin. I was like, that's great. Um, but you know what? Tonight's going to be a night. You've kicked the lurgy. You're sounding great. You look fresh. You've still got a beard on your face. And I'm looking forward to talking about all the shit housery. Over the last couple of weeks, it feels like, you know, all the all the stuff in the system that was going to go wrong, it's happened. The fallout is massive. Everything is coming up roses. Yeah. Me, my friend. Yeah. Let's go. Um, we also were talking before the podcast, Engine Mode 11 on Twitter, over 70K. Let's Can we get a... Can we get a W? Can we get a W, homies? Big old fat W. I don't know why. But like we said, I, my content is just shite. But I appreciate the supporters of the shite. <laughs> but, and if you listen to this podcast, you're also a supporter of shite. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. For anybody that doesn't listen to this podcast, who the fuck are you? Oh, well, my name is Dan. Uh, I live in uh, the Nidge, Stevenage, and uh, for six years, I stole a living off of Red Bull Racing as a senior systems engineer until Love eventually Love that. I found out that I was a fraud and I did nothing. Um, no, I left because I wanted to spend more time with my kids and that, which is why I have decided to abandon them and come and do a podcast <laughs> instead. I love it. I love it. Get wrecked, kids. No, don't do that. Um, But... I mean, that's, that's pretty okay. cool. okay. We're, we're recording this on Halloween, and before we uh, recorded this, I went out trick-or-treating. Um, as you can see, I'm in my Red Bull racing kit. I had some £20 notes hanging out my pocket. I went as the uh, cost cap breach. <laughs> I, I guess we'll get to that, but it's, it seems like they were only like 20 quid over or something in the end, wasn't it? Oh, uh, that's going to be interesting. But if anybody's new tuning into the podcast, Dan and I are two complete frauds. Um... I, Dan and I met at Red Bull, but we never actually talked when we were at Red Bull. So I, I, I spent a, mm. a couple years in the uh, the traveling circus as a trackside performance engineer. And now, uh, then I went to work in the simulator as a simulator performance engineer. Did some really cool shit. Got to see some cool things. Um, and now I'm doing content creation full time, which sounds weird. Um, but there's a video. I, was, I've, I've just, I don't want to sidetrack too much, but there's a video I made about quitting my job at Red Bull because I've achieved everything I wanted to do and I wanted to try something new. I wanted to do a challenge in my life. I wanted to, uh, you know, I really enjoyed making gaming content. And then I realized I'm passionate about Formula One and I know some things that I could share about. I don't know everything uh, and I'm very open about that. That video is blowing up on every social media platform I've had in the past couple of months, but it's finally taken off on YouTube. So uh, we just crushed uh, 30,000 subs a week ago on YouTube. Uh, then today yesterday 40,000 subs and it looks like 50,000 by the end of the week so there goes all of my uh, first year of content creation and formula one goals smashed through nice easy gg so, uh, yeah so I'm, I'm now only making probably 10 percent of my previous salary so i'm winning mm. right now it's great it's 40, 40 pound a week yeah exactly exactly you know, I just follow Adrian around because it, it costs him more money to lean over and pick up the 20 pound note. And I just kind of go hoover those up. Uh, and he doesn't, yeah. his time's too expensive for that. So, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. So, so, speaking of social media goals, did you know that the podcast, we've got over 5,000 followers on Twitter this week? Wow. Big up, big up, big up, big up. Mm. And the podcast has reached 35,000 listens. Let's go. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, what are you guys doing? Like, imagine imagine how low the bar must be for you guys to want to listen to our podcast. This blows my mm. mind. But 
on, on it doesn't a... say all 35,000 listened all the way through. Let's yeah. be very clear. 34,999 <laughs> of them could be people listening to the first 10 seconds going, fuck this, I'm out. Yeah, let's go. Let's go get out of here. Crap podcast. But no, see, on a, on a serious note, um, we don't usually go on about this that much, but anybody that's tuned in, uh, interacted with us on social media or just watched it or shared the podcast with your friends or your nan or your, your grandpa, thank you guys very much because you guys make this fun and if you guys weren't listening to it we'd probably have canceled it by now but we're having a blast and also for anybody listening or watching this on youtube we do record this live on twitch.tv front slash b r r r a k e uh every week so usually mondays or tuesdays will be live so uh check us out we'll post the notifications we go live but why don't we uh quit screwing everybody over we're six minutes in and we haven't even talked about any shithousery fraudulence or drama Let's get well, involved. We've spoken about ourselves, so that's quite fraudulent. Ah, oh, fair. Okay. All right, you're, you're welcome. Mexico. Well, before Mexico, how about all the news and drama? Talk to me, bro. Talk because to me. Because, boy, have we got a lot of it. Well, what about what about news that doesn't have to do with Mexico this year? Uh, well, Mexico got extended until 2025. So, I mean, technically, that's not this year. No. But, like, after this race... I've had, I've, I think we've had a couple of really good Mexico Grand Prix that have been entertaining. This one, however, um, at the front of the field was shocking. It was so boring. But yep. hopefully next season, uh, the performance gap will close because we have had new regulations. Yes, these regs were meant to make the racing closer. But anytime you introduce new sets of regulations, you will have a shakeup. You will have teams spread out. Um, and then hopefully, hopefully by the time we get to the end of 2025, uh, we don't have three-tier racing mm, but right here i was thinking about this earlier do we think mexico is exciting because we go into it expecting about 400 cars to explode and when it doesn't happen we all sit there and think well this was shite nah i wasn't really or hoping do we think the racing's actually genuinely good there we've seen a couple like i think everybody was too sensible today there's a couple people taking a few l's uh gas man ricardo for example but yeah you know that, that's not particularly malicious it was just a little bit of bump in. I think the fact that we've effectively got, I was going to say three tier racing, but we actually have four tier racing, which I'll clarify uh, shortly. So don't miss out on that. That's a very technical explanation there. Okay. And before we move ahead any further, a quick PSA to say that if you can hear dogs barking in the background, that's mine because obviously it's Halloween and trick or treat is a setting them off. I will try my best to shut them up, but bear with me. So yeah, moving on. Well, I'm going to have cats in here in a minute anyway, so if you're watching... Your cats don't make any noise. They're really cute. They just cute. sit there and, and sort of lay on your table and... and... And crash the stream and almost kill the recording? Yeah, I remember that. Oh, yeah, I did forget about that. When <laughs> they go, which one was it that opened about 10,000 tabs on your computer? Mm. Sterling, wasn't it? Yeah, he's a little... He's a little shit. Yeah. So, yes, uh, Mexico extended until 2025. Uh, great, good. I... I don't hate the track and I don't particularly love it either. Fair. Um, I like the stadium section because I think that's vibes. Yeah, the atmosphere on the podium. Like I watched a video on stream the other day from 2017 and I was probably 10 people from the front row at the podium ceremony in the middle of the baseball stadium. It was epic. Uh, Martin Garrix, the DJ set dropped and the bass was like ripping your chest apart. It was it was heavy. So that was, that was very cool. That was very cool. And... Uh, I think once the racing gets, the cars get closer in terms of overall performance, I think we could see some better races this year. Um, not particularly exciting as a Grand Prix, unfortunately. No, but qualifying was good, and we'll go into yeah. that in a bit. But yeah, qualifying yeah. was quite exciting. Uh, second piece of news, which isn't so dramatic, Audi and Sauber have officially announced their link-up for 2026. Now, if you're sitting there scratching your head saying, what, who are Sauber? That's who uh, Alpha Romeo are if you peel off the sponsorship sticker. Um, Peter so, Sauber. Yes, Peter Sauber. Peter, um, Peter Klein. in Switzerland, aren't they, I believe? I can't remember. Yeah. I think it's Switzerland. Hinwil or something? Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, that is 100% correct. Uh, Alpha Romeo also announced that uh, they will end the title sponsorship with Sauber at the end of 2023. But do not fear, because the gap between 23 and 2026 They'll still be running the Ferrari power units, but I'm not sure what they're going to brand themselves as, whether they're just going to continue as Sauber yet. Um, yeah, that's, that a, gap. that's an interesting one because can 
Yeah, that's like, do they bring on Audi as a technology partner in the short term or what? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how happy Ferrari would be to be on a car that's got I, Audi stamped on the side of it. Let's be honest. I, I don't know how happy Audi would be to have their stamp on the side of a car running those engines. Yeah, very true. Um, so yeah, uh, that will Audi will start producing the power unit at one of their German factories in 2026. It's a works sponsorship slash technical partnership with Sauber. Now, I know there were some rumours around that Audi were looking to buy into a team earlier yep. in the year, but I've not seen any mention if they've actually bought into Sauber Ooh. as part of this. That's um, super interesting. Because like mm. Porsche, Porsche wanted a big chunk of the Red Bull deal, and that's where that thing fell through. So, may, our, yeah, that's a yeah. very... I, I think we are um, watch this space for any developments on what's actually happened with that. But... Yeah, Sauber are, uh, or have been in the past, fairly recently, struggling a little bit with the older money. So perhaps mm. maybe there may have been some um, buyout, or not buyout, but investment from Audi. But this isn't the first time Audi and Sauber have worked together. Did you know Ooh. that, Blake? No, I actually didn't know that. They have worked together between the years of 2006 and 2014, because Audi when they were running their LMP1 diesels at uh, World Endurance, were using the Sauber wind tunnel. Ooh, okay. I remember that car. So there's an underlying relationship there already. I saw one of those Audis uh, in Austin at the, uh, what is it, the Masters Endurance race. So it's a bunch of old WEC cars. Uh, mm. There was one of the old open top Audis. It was gorgeous. You know, the silver red uh, shell. Yes, the oh. R8. Yeah, R R eight. I kept saying R eighteen the other day, but it's an R eight TDI. Yeah, the car it makes sounds wild, don't it, they? It makes no noise, man. I yeah. saw the car at the Petit Le Mans, and the car's going around the, the, at the back into the track. There's a double right hander. You hear the tires on the tarmac. You do not hear the engine. Then you hear like a, a Maserati or a Corvette or a Panos just rip by, and the V 8s ripping your guts apart. But then you see here this, and you're like, what was that? Uh, that was probably McNish. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yes um before i got into f1 i would i went to le mans a few times and i, I saw them there and that was uh an interesting experience like can, you say the sound was very different can i put myself on fraud watch this week yeah 100 percent. why what have you done i've never been to le mans oh, i don't think that's fraud watch as such i think a Did lot you, of people haven't actually been. i'm i'm a motorsport enthusiast <laughs> Uh, and I've been in the UK for almost 12 years, and I've never made the journey to Le Mans. But to be fair, my first seven years, I was flat out with first year in Formula student when I was in uni. And then six years, I was traveling f full time to all the races. So I was like, the fuck am I going to go to uh, Le Mans for yeah. a weekend? I've spent 20 plus weekends away. Yes, yeah, I can understand if you're working in F1, then um, perhaps maybe spending your time off going to another race isn't quite the uh, ideal holiday. But next year is the uh, 100th anniversary, so I'm going to try to get, get along to that. Ooh, and if you oh, want to uh, come bro. and share a tent with me, then... Uh, oh yeah, dude, I've got lethal farts though. Have you? Are you big spoon or little spoon? Middle spoon. Middle spoon, okay. There's going to be a third wheel we don't know about yet. Okay, cool. Sarah said she's not coming, so I'm not sure who it is. It's going to be someone from the pod. We'll, we'll let you a competition. If hey. you want sandwiched by me and Blake, <laughs> then hell, enter the competition. Uh, Let's go. That's disgusting. Like, uh, what, happens, what happens in France stays in France. Like, But like, to be fair, though, just as a, a little bit of a, a thing that we could manifest now, uh, I really feel like some content in Le Mans next year could be fucking golden, man. Do the road trip, do a vlog, mm -hmm. hang out, meet up with some people. Um, somebody in the live stream said that the third wheel is Helmet Marco. Yeah, okay. Sure. He's got to pay me a lot of fucking money. <laughs> He's got some spare, I think, by the sounds of it. But <sighs> anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna let's let's get back on track. Let's yeah. what, what do we got? But like seriously though, uh manifest that chat. Uh, engine braking fraud cast at Lamar 2023. Yep. I'll be in the background, drunk, rolling around on the floor while Blake tries to do a serious content creation. No, I'm going to, we're going to get cancelled, bro. Sweet. Sweeter than that. Uh, so, yeah, sorry. That was Audi and Salva, which turned into a Helmet Marco sandwich. I'm not sure how we got there, but definitely leaving wow. that one in the podcast. Um, yeah, definitely. Don't edit that. 
Don't ration uh, the passion, baby. No. Uh, Red Bull decided to boycott Sky Sports, which I thought was hilarious. So, I... Christ, I saw this blowing up all over social media, and I really fucking struggled to understand what was going on here. So, I'm going to try and break it down what's happened. B -b 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 break it down? Oh, yeah, I see what you did there. Very good, very good. Um, right. So, Ted Kravitz, in his post-US Grand Prix uh, notebook, so if you don't know who this is, it's um, Ted Kravitz works for Sky Sports. And in the UK, uh, they do like, um, I think it's like a 30-minute segment post-race where he walks down the uh, the paddock and just sort of gives you a rundown of what happened and whatnot for each team. Is it The Notebook so, starring Ted Kravitz? Yeah. Or Ted's which, Notebook? Uh, <laughs> the savage rumour, or, or what I was hold, uh, told, was that he doesn't actually write the notes in that notebook. But I've, I've seen people come back at me on Twitter say giving me evidence to the contrary so i'm not sure well that's a sick rumor that i'll start i've seen him in the paddock writing in that notebook but okay. maybe, maybe it's one of those things he has a, a ghost writer where they write the notes mm. and he just traces over it possibly yeah um so yes during this this segment he did uh post us grand prix he said something about how max's title uh or no sorry how the title was stolen from lewis hamilton in Abu Dhabi and Something about Lewis is an eight-time world champion, right? So first and foremost, any sensible person, I don't care if you're a Max fan or not, if you're probably going to turn around and say, you know what, Abu Dhabi 2021 was a bit of a shit show. I'll oh, grant it. A you little that. bit of one. It was a huge yeah, shit show. Exactly. So, but then no, Christian sort of just apparently. Then we heard that all Sky Sports media were getting boycotted. Um, there was no comments from any of the drivers. Not just or UK Sky Sports. No, it was all of them. Correct. So Sky Sports also have Sky Italy and Sky Germany. Yeah. They also See? got boycotted but didn't understand why, which I okay. think is hilarious. They even tweeted the team, I think, basically saying, what's going on? Why have we been included in this? Entschuldigung. Entschuldigung. Mm. Achtung. Schnell. Um, and then, yeah, so sorry, Christian said there were some derogatory comments made, so we took a break from Sky for this race. Max was upset. We were upset. And we made the decision to stand together as a team. Some of the commentaries are fair, but some pieces are sensationalist. And saying we robbed anyone of the championship, as was said in Austin, is going too far. It is not impartial or fair or balanced. We have said our piece and we will go back to normal next race. Can I... Right, here we go. Load it up. Here's Dan's hot take. Go on. I couldn't give a flying fuck about this. This is so fucking playground and petty. I don't give a shit. Yeah. Sky are mid, so who gives a fuck? <laughs> Right, Sky are just the Waitrose version of WTF one. Oh, right. Oh, I see what you've done there. Oh, Maddie's gonna love you for this. Or is wait? Yeah. Ah, uh, just I don't. I really don't give a fuck. Like, who fucking cares if Ted says that and saying that it's not impartial? Find me a fucking yeah, commentator, yeah. commentator, or sports media, whatever that is impartial there isn't one even us like when we talk we say we're ex Dude. red bull we've, we've probably got some rose tinted goggles on absolutely i don't know it just seems fucking drama it, for drama's sake it's childish but i think i think one of the things that max touched on and i i don't know where i stand on this because like, i'm with you actually i could probably not give a fuck like i really couldn't but there's a lot of shit fighting and people are just like, it's just like the Twitter is a cesspit. It's terrible. It's disgusting. You need a hazmat suit to even fucking open your web browser in the morning. But implying that Red Bull have, you know, deliberately cheated, that they stole the championship and all this other stuff. Do not like, I don't understand why people are fans. And in this instance, I think Ted is a super fan and he loves Lewis. And but and that's fine. I, I don't mind any of that. It's just the fact that. It's, it's like saying that you guys fuck this, you guys cheat. It's like, you need, to, everybody that's upset needs to direct their distrust and their disinterest towards the FIA, not the team. Yeah. Yeah. But if you turn, turn it around, flip this, fit, if flip the roles, right? If that had happened in the opposite way, people would be mad at the other team. But still, Still, the problem is the FIA and the officiating and the lack of clarity and the inconsistency. That is the problem. But I will say, if you're one of those sad fucks that's going on Ted Kravitz's Instagram and leaving him hate messages and abusing him, you're a loser. 
that's there's no room for that like that is yeah. like if you don't agree with somebody do not do not go at them like yeah so there's, be there's, it there's there's banter right which is what we have and Every then time. there's just there's just hate yeah and and there's just ugh. yeah now what's the point of hate? Yeah. Yeah, you, you give you're getting too worked up over a sport that doesn't give a fuck about you. Yeah, uh, just ask the drivers how they feel about you. Hey, tell them your name first and say, "Hey, do you know me?" And they're like, "Never fucking heard of you, mate." Like, I no. don't, I don't care. Daniel if Ricardo didn't even remember you, did he? Well, fucking bastard, man. <laughs> that was classic, Dan. And if anybody's wondering what that video was, uh, I did a little uh, promo with F one twenty two, the game, and uh, Danny Rick challenge. And he challenged me to uh, beat his hot lap. I couldn't, and I had to go anyway. So that's why I packed my bag because I knew I was mid. But uh, he he blasted me. He pretended he didn't remember me, but then described everything about me. Dork. But anyway, let's 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 bury that because I'm not too interested in that. And like, you know, if some if a commentator says some shit about you, that's fine. Um, if they're making if, if if they're lying, that's a problem. And if they're entertaining, you know, fall, yeah. like 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 you know the like defamatory false narratives that's one thing and i don't think they're doing that i i think you can interpret no, what ted said it's... several ways and it's just like if you're annoyed about it so be it and you have the the right to cut them off if you want to but yeah it's uh, a very british loving at sky sports and i think all they're doing is just sort of of you know putting their flag on the mast and saying you know we are what they call it? Brit Fossey? I don't know. Either way, whatever. Brit, Brit fine. Fossey. Sky oh. shit anyway. So if you don't like it, I strongly suggest you uh, don't subscribe to them anymore. You get a VPN and uh, get F1 TV Pro because it's far superior. F1 TV is fucking sick. And we get to enjoy Sky Sports for like another, what, seven years or whatever it is. Now they've got the new exclusivity deal. Anyway, sorry. I went off on a rant there. there Basically, fuck Sky big up f1 tv it's all a bit mounting out of a molehill and a bit dramatic so whatever but it's okay because he's christian said in brazil we're going back to normal so it's just for this good. race good um oh, now i've got that rant out of the way we're ready for another one well i don't know necessarily it's gonna nah, be a this, rant this, this is, is just... this is the big one and it's so big i've had to put it on a separate separate notes page wow right it's the cost cap saga. Let's just rip through it. Like I, I feel like, I feel like everybody knows about it. What's what's the headlines of this one, and like, what's your take on it? Because I think that's what people want to know. So, on the Wednesday, the twenty sixth, so the Wednesday of uh, Mexico, um, the FIA and RBR came to an agreed breach agreement, which I think we sort of had, we sort of knew that was coming. Um. And we're going to break it down. So here we go. Red Bull Racing's submitted costs for 2021 were 114293000 Now, the cap was 118, uh, $118,036,000, whatever. So, so they were basically, they came so they were effectively under. four grand or 400. Four, four, four mil, mil under, yeah, essentially. They thought they were right? four mil under, yeah. But then the cost cap administration, um, issued them a procedural breach because there was some inaccurate documentation and and basically red bull having in, inaccurately excluded or adjusted some costs amounted to 5.6 million so these costs uh, include they overstated excluded costs concerning catering services which is one of the rumors that was going around wasn't it um costs concerning uh employer social security contributions now, for our US listeners, I'm not really sure what that would translate to. Um, Social Security would be like, yeah. yeah. Is it the same? In, yeah, like, same, like, yeah, okay. a, like tax. Yeah, like a tax off your pay. Um, costs pursuant to non F1 activities. Uh, costs in respect to bonuses uh, for the employers. Uh, understatement of relevant costs in respect of a gain on disposal of fixed assets by failing to make the necessary upwards adjustment. I don't know what that means. I don't give a shit either. If you know what that means, big up yourself. Uh, costs pursuant to apprenticeship levies. So in the UK, if you take on apprenticeships, you get like um, 
like a tax break or something yeah. like that. So I think that's related to that. Uh, this one was interesting. I thought understatement of relevant costs concerning the cost of use of power units. Um, but then the next point, they say clerical error in respect of Red Bull Racing's calculation of certain costs recharged to it by Red Bull powertrains. So basically, they expense something wrong and then they receive the bill for it for the wrong things or something like that. Yeah, it looks like. There's a lot of clerical errors in this, and there's a big one I'll get to in a minute. Um, and the other ones were certain travel costs and costs of maintenance. And what they mean by that is uh, maintenance around the Milton Keynes campus, you know, like uh, cleaning. Did they ever fix that one like toilet that. upstairs? The one that always blocked? Yeah. No. It's been blocked for like four years. You know the one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everyone knows it. Um, so <laughs> once... <laughs> So once they added those that 5.6 million of costs that they'd incorrectly done to their original 114 million, uh, it turns out they were 1.6 over that 118 million by 1.8, sorry, 100, 1.8 1. million, million, which is 1.6 percent of the cost cap. I'm sorry, guys, if this is really you're struggling to keep up, but this is how bad it is. It's it's a nightmare. But then this is the fun bit, right? So there were 1.8 million over, but the FIA actually turned around and said to Red Bull Racing, if you actually correctly applied a notational tax credit within that submission, you would have only have been over by 432,000, which is 0.37%. So hilariously, the FIA did not only just say to them, actually, you've calculated this wrong and you've gone over. They also turned around and said, actually, you could have been a lot, a lot more under if you, if you, calculated this tax rebate correctly which i thought was hilarious uh so in the end it turns out they have a minor overspend breach of that four hundred and thirty two thousand six hundred and fifty two pounds now the punishment for which is, the incorrect just to put that in perspective people are like it's they're gonna be seven million over <laughs> they're, they're like less than half a million over which is still over so there's a punishment for it Yes, so for the incorrect uh, um, documentation in regards to the costs, yada yada, that's the seven million dollars fine. Which this is again, this is hilarious. I like how they've done all these figures in pounds, but the fines in dollars. Uh, seven million dollars. They got to pay that to the FIA within thirty days. That doesn't come out of any cost cap, future, past, present, which I thought was a, another amusing little. Uh, is it going into Menicali's pocket? And well, um, I understand this. When you have to pay a monetary fine to the FIA, it goes to their FIA uh, road safety charity thing they do. So that's, um, that's like where they buy bottles of wine after the races on the yachts and probably, invite the team principals. Yeah. yeah. Basically, they're the ones that are going to be buying the uh, really posh sandwiches now. <laughs> yeah, fuckers. Um, but because of that £432,000 being over, that goes into a minor sporting penalty, which is a the 10 percent reduction of aero testing for 12 months from the date of the uh, agreed breach agreement so that's now basically from a year from that wednesday now aero testing includes obviously the wind tunnel but it also includes cfd testing which i think a lot of people were overlooking yeah it's, uh, it's, it's, it's equivalence basically you get so many aero testing units and depending on how you apportion your wind tunnel and cfd time there's a sliding scale of which you can do that so yep and they also have to pay all the costs associated with the ABA, which when you have a $7 million fine, I don't really think they're going to notice that part as such. No. So, yeah, I reached out to a few people in different teams as well, because when you've worked in F1, you do know people in places that have done aero or work with aero. And I said, like, what 10% reduction in aero and CFD, like, how bad is that? And it was kind of split down the middle. So some people say it's not really the end of the world, while others have said they're going to drop out the top three. So it's, 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 they don't, no one really knows what this is going, to, what effect this is going to have. So yeah. I await with bated breath. Me personally, I think this punishment is fine. It makes sense. Look, if they're a pound over, they're a pound over. It is what it yep. is. All right, take it on the chin. Um. But I run, uh, I ran a public opinion poll on Twitter, right? Which Ooh. granted, I know I've got a lot of uh, heavy Red Bull bias in my Twitter following. Some stands. So, 
you know, let's just say that outright. What's Stan's so, last name, by the way? Smith. Stan Smith. Um, so, yeah, with that bias in mind, uh, we got 16,500 votes. 12.7% said it's harsh. 45% said it's about right. And 423 said it's too lenient. So, it, again, even Twitter, Twitter's a bit split down the middle that it's about right or it's a bit too lenient. Of those one of those 16,500 people, um, how many of those do you think were qualified to make an assessment on that, understanding the significant impact of um, uh, equivalent aerodynamic development hours and so on? Um, exactly the same percent of people that are on this podcast now that qualified to make that sort of judgment, and that's 0%. Correct. Correct. I don't know. You don't know. Nobody fucking knows. No. Well, and we'll see. And the other thing to keep in mind as well is it's it's not nothing to, nothing to do with the penalty, but the new rules regarding wind tunnel and aero development. Um, there's a sliding scale. So if you finish first, you get less time than whoever finishes second and third. And if you finish down in like seventh and eighth, you get more than the baseline. So you get a lot more. So there's going to be a big difference between uh, Red Bull and whoever finishes second in the championship this year because Red Bull are getting 10% less than that. So, um, but the, the, thing, I... the thing to take note of, though, is the FIA stated the, the Red Bull appeared to have done all this stuff correctly. They've been transparent. They haven't hidden anything. And Red Bull thought they were under. And I, it, bothers, it bothers me. It's like, why was... Why was there not clarification sooner? You know, like as in as I in, think the whole process has taken far too long. Yeah, and I think the FIA are partially to blame with some of the chaos they've caused by just saying Rebel are over the breach or, or committed a breach. See, my dogs are angry about it. You fucking little FIA. Ah, fuck. Arr. But they, um, they basically threw it out there into the world and left and then it. just disappeared for like three yeah. weeks. Yeah, which is which is ba They've done themselves no favors because at the end of the day, uh, the Red Bull will get penalized, and they have been. Everything's happened, but all they did was just literally, they're like, man, the season's really fucking boring. Why don't we talk with Netflix and kick off a stink bomb and drum up some interest in a yeah, championship let's, that's fucking... Let's forget to carry, carry the one on a few calculations. Let's not claim back the tax correctly and uh, give people something to... Go on, lad. Stuck into. <laughs> yeah, I, me personally, um, it all seems fine to me. So, um, I think that it will not hinder them too much. Uh, and then also, as well, another thing to say is the 2023 car, most of that's going to be done already. So, for the start of 2023, it's not going to really affect them it's it's going to be more sort of that in-season development as they go along yeah. so we might not see so many upgrades towards the end of the year and we might see um a questionable start for the 2024 car they have to prioritize what they want to do 2023 yeah. in-season upgrades or 2024 car yes so yeah we'll see but in the ideal world what i hope as a fan happens is that it brings them all closer together and uh, we actually get a proper ding dong fight because uh, I'm I'm just gonna whisper it. Even though I'm a massive Red Bull fan, this season's been a bit boring, really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's been drama, but not really the right kind. I, and it makes me look back and actually miss last season. I know everybody got super toxic because fans can't deal with the fact that drivers uh, make mistakes sometimes, or they crash, or their driver doesn't get along with their other driver. So. Um, you know, just a lot of really mature people that uh, understand sport and can appreciate all that goes into it. Yeah, fucking we don't, dorks. We don't want. Uh, we don't want peace. We want problems. Yeah, I want that. I want competition. Yeah, bring it on. Uh, so yeah, that, that's. I think that's it really for major news points. Nice. Should we get into the weekend then? We got the we Mexican should, Grand yeah. Prix. Uh, fortunately, um, FP1 and FP2 were kind of shit sessions, so not they really. Wouldn't. But just for you, I've still taken some notes. Ooh, so, love that. I've just because, discussed this now. Yeah, because I was bored on my um, uh, work today, I decided to rewatch uh, FP1, FP2, FP3 qualifying and the race. So I Flat smashed today, it out mate. in one day. Yep. So thank you very much for my company that paid for me to do that. Cheers, lads. Yep. 
FP1, right. I noticed when Vettel was in the box in his Aston Mine, his steering wheel had a track map on it. I've never seen that before. I haven't seen that in a while. Not since they got the PCU8 dashes, you know, the, with the big square screen on the steering mm -hmm. wheel. Usually, yeah, it was on that. Yeah, usually the... Ah, a digital map. Yes. Yeah, I've seen... Uh, teams have been doing that. Yeah. Ah, I didn't know if that was a thing. Is it? Is it just a map or is it a driver tracker? No, it's just a map. It's just, oh, okay. just a, re a reference. They put it in a display position on the steering wheel. And yeah. if they're stationary and the car is plugged in, it'll throw yes. yeah, uh, it was a map on the, It was on the umbilical cord, so yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Didn't know that. So there you go. I'm glad I asked that. Uh, FP1, we had a few uh, newbies or whatever you want to call them, young drivers. Uh, Logan Sargent in the Williams. Uh, this is the funny thing about this, right? So if you do 100 kilometers in an FP1, you get a super license point, right? Yeah. Logan Sargent really needs some super license points. Yeah, he does. So he can get in that Willys next year, right? Yeah. So you need 100 kilometers to get that super license points. How many did he do in FP1, Blake? Like just over 99. And 96 kilometers. He needed one more lap. Pretty much, yeah. So he missed out on that super license point. Well done, him. Uh, Liam Lawson was in the Alpha Towery, but that didn't really go to plan because he had to pull over with a PU issue and then his brakes rather spectacularly caught fire in the stadium Ooh. section. Uh, Nick DeVries uh, was in the Mercedes. Nick DeVries became, or DeVries? Yeah, Nick DeVries. He became Where? Nick DeVries. Pirelli's um, are scared of DeVries. Yes. Uh, Jack Doohan was in the Alpine. Um, he had to stop early due to a PU issue. Uh, a sign of things to come, I think, for that team. Um, Fittipaldi was in the Haas. Yeah, foreshadowing. Uh, Fittipaldi was in the Haas. Then he had to stop. Caused a red flag. Because he had to stop, um, I think, at the end of the straight. Because a bit of smoke started coming out for the engine. Uh, that would turn into a ice change, which means Magnussen would have to take a penalty for the race. And uh, Gwen Yujo uh, basically got stuck because his gearbox refused to change gear. Classic. That was pretty much, pretty much all we had in FP1. But we had quite a lot of reliability concerns in there, which is something that we get at Mexico. Yeah. Tell them about the air... Don't tell them about the air molecules. They're sick of Ted talking about the air molecules. Oh, yeah. Basically, you're at higher... At, uh, I'm going to explain it in my way. Deal with it. Come on. You're at a higher altitude. The air's less dense. Yeah. So... You can run a fat load of wing on your car because the air is less dense, there's less drag. Because of that, it also means it's more inefficient at cooling. Yep. So there's more concerns over brakes, uh, PU, and uh, things like that. And anyway. another another thing that tends to happen is because there's fewer air molecules, the turbos need to spin faster uh, to get all the air in the engine. Because the, in an altitude with a turbo engine, you do not lose as much power, or you probably very lose very little power unless your turbo can't spin fast enough because of its sizing and uh that's Which a little bit of foreshadowing a problem for ferrari well yes in this in this instance but in the past the reason why red bull always used to do so well is because the uh pu honda pu had a larger turbo a big old blower <laughs> than the mercedes so it could cope better with higher altitude like this <sighs> no, i'm just kidding i'm not gonna do that wow that was I've beautiful got, i've got to kick the cat out he's in like super lover mode give me 30 seconds okay i'm just gonna bang on with fp2 while he throws his cat out so free practice two was another one of the pirelli extended tire sessions uh which is a bit boring because they're not allowed to make setup changes or practice starts so they have to stick to a baseline so fp2 it was 90 minutes it was a bit dull not a lot really happened, but Charles did have his rather large shunt in FP2, didn't he, Blake? Oh, yeah, he smashed it up, ripped the back off that thing almost, didn't he? He did. Um, a big old shunt for him. Uh, no penalty or anything because um, everything was salvageable, I believe. And Gwen Yuzhou, after breaking down in FP1, decided to break down again in FP2. <laughs> no, dude. He's so unlucky, issue. man. I really like him, and he's so damn unlucky. And he's extremely yeah. fashionable as well. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's got drip, man. Yeah, hella drip. Hella drip. I, uh, I, I will say, though, I really hate how the FIA have let the teams get involved with the tire testing. They're like, oh, we can't afford testing because this and that. And it's like, well, then they're like, right, well, then we'll just probably like, well, we need to test for next year because we're going to go to lower blanket temperatures. 
and they don't allow any time in the season for testing the teams like oh it's going to cost engines and all this other stuff it's like just fucking make up a rule but like tire testing in fp2 is bullshit it's so bullshit and so yes. useless it's it a waste of time it's terrible to, to watch me. it's not fun and i fucking hate it it screams to me of oh my god we forgot we have to make a new compound next year can we do a tire test 100 percent like they all and i wouldn't be surprised with pirelli if that wasn't far from the truth all they need to do is fork out the fucking cash and buy a mule car from someone next year and they're not going to do it because they're i'm not going to say it they used to have one yeah they, they, they did they, they the did era. yeah they did back in the day but they need to fucking fork out the cash and buy a test car because how else are they going to develop tires because teams aren't going to agree to do anything that's going to cost them cost cap so unless the FIA figures this out, we've got the next two years. Next year, lower blankets. The year after, no blankets. They need some testing. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. That was that. Uh, FP3. Uh, there wasn't really much to say about it, really. Um, the only thing that I noted down was Mercedes uh, did like a 1-2 towards the end. And they, they looked quite significantly quicker than uh, other people. So... Was that just a glory run, do you think? Yeah, they were showboating because in qualifying, nobody approached those times until Q2. They, so you think they turned it up a little bit or underfueled it? Yeah, or something. And maybe there's a good reason for doing that. So I don't think it was all engine because that's a lot of a lot, a lot of power to turn up. Um, I think they probably they might have run lower fuel because often things that happen, you don't see people doing it too often in FP3. They usually leave a bit of fuel in the car. It's probably somewhere between 20 and 40 kilos of fuel in P3 for a low fuel run. But what they could have done is said, usually when we take the fuel out, we have different balance problems. And they're like, right, let's set up the car for qualifying. So let's see what the car is like on fumes. Fuel it for two laps. And mm -hmm. to, get the, to, get the, to make the most out of it. Because the fact that nobody got even remotely close to those lap times until Q2. Yeah, well... So the possibility that they did that for some balance issues or to investigate some balance during qualifying leads us nicely into qualifying. That's and the, the Mercedes, next session. Mercedes were looking awfully quick in qualifying. Absolutely. Yeah. And they, I mean, like, yeah, what do we, like in Q1, uh, oh man, that was emotional. I mean, we, I, we fed him with his disappointed q1 radio message oh yeah we got the message again didn't we i'm sad but but yeah. he he did the same lap time identical to mick in the house yes he did but i believe the way it works is because mick did it first he technically is the position above seb correct but it doesn't matter because they were both out in q1 yeah. anyway so somebody popped a lap in like late in that run and uh dunked them all yeah uh hamilton was fastest in Q1, I believe. Yeah. Um, so a bit of hopium there for the Merck fans. I know there's some of you listening, and you are going through it this year. Um, Max did an extra outlap, I noted down here. Are you aware of this? They've been doing that a couple times. Um, it looks like we've got another instance of it again in Q1. So they do a outlap, slow lap, push lap, or they might have aborted. I didn't know if he had a fast sector one or not. So they, they do that sometimes where they... Uh, they do an outlap and then a push lap, and it has something to do with, I'm I'm assuming the tires. I guarantee it's the tires, but mm, yeah. Um. So yeah, out of Q1, we lost Latifi, Albon, Stroll, Vettel, Mick. Uh, it's kind of the usual crowd, really, isn't it? I don't think anyone's that surprised with that bunch. No. Nah. Uh, Q2 again. I've pff, nothing really happened in Q2 apart from Hamilton was fastest again. Hmm. Um. At this point, I was starting to think. Mm, Maybe, maybe. We've got a we've got a DEFCON four on the beard. And if anybody's listening to the podcast for the first time, you haven't heard it before. If Mercedes win a race this year, Dan is shaving his beard off after uh he plays Father Christmas in December. Yep. So the beard was starting to twinge a little bit at Q two. Did you talk to it at all? It's okay. Beard. It's okay. No, I just I just stroked it a little bit. Yeah, fine. Um blasted it with nicotine and uh coffee. Hell yeah. It's what all content creators are uh, running on. I'm just running on sadness. <laughs> I don't have any sad music available to play for that, I'm afraid. But oh, yeah. 
I'll have to get some on the soundboard. Okay. Uh, Q3. Hamilton lost his first time due to track limits. Uh, so his second run basically had to be a good one. Otherwise, he was in trouble. He didn't have a banker lap. And it was faster than the track limit one as well. Yep. Um, but it looked close between Mercedes and Max. Um, both the Mercedes were trading purple sectors with yep. Max. Uh, but then Max just dunked like 0.3 of a second on them, which I yep. thought was hilarious after all that. So looking at it, I think he probably didn't get his sectors all together. And then in Q3 final run, he finally smashed it in. Uh, George, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, George and Lewis did have a little bit of time. They didn't put their perfect sectors together on that final lap. But I mean, there's still a couple tenths off, man. Not not too shabby. It's the closest we've seen them since Hungary, where Russell was on pole. Yeah, and that's, that still seems wild to me that even back as far as Hungary, Mercedes managed to get a pole this year. Because let's, let's not beat around the bush. The W13 has been a bit of a shit bag this year. But this is yeah. what happens when you call your car or reference the number 13 in your car. Because RB, RB13 was dog shit. Yep. I was about to say, let's go back to the happy memories of the RB13. Oh, dude, the, the tagline for that was unlucky for some. It's like, yeah, for us, because yeah, it's a shitload of DNFs. Oh, my God. Oh, fun times. Fun yeah. times. Um, but um, speculate real quick. I, I, I will speculate why Mercedes are so quick. So the the trend this so far this season, let's, let's take from Hungary forwards, because earlier in the season, there were a lot of other issues. It seems like they've sorted a bunch of those issues. Uh, with sea mammals. The the W13 tends to go well at high drag, low efficiency circuits. So when you tend to put more wing on and the car is, you know, you could like, especially tracks like Hungary, we just put a big, nearly Monaco spec rear wing on it. The biggest thing you can, um, this one as well. It doesn't matter that the top speeds are high. It matters in terms of the efficiency where they're at. So that seems like a factor. So Brazil's next. It's another high altitude circuit, but it's not the lowest, or it's not the high, 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 high downforce track. So I expect them to go reasonably well, uh, but I... I you expect I, them to be as close? I don't think so. I don't think as okay. close, but, but at the same time, um, I think we should talk about the race because there's a lot of implications on compromises of the car's qualifying versus race hell yeah let's get on to the race because we're oh. 45 minutes into the podcast and we're not even talked about the race yet uh the race the race so, is kind of the race just kind of flows man should i kick this one off hit it go for it hit it pre-race uh we got the grid everything sorted uh qualifying was exciting actually i was excited about qualifying in it it finished with a bang, yeah, Verstappen on good. pole. I was not expecting that, honestly, especially after seeing, I think I got a little bit blinded by the showboating in P3, but then as soon as like, I was like, wait, they're not doing those lap times yet. I was like, okay, a little showboating. But the pre-race, uh, Stroll had earned himself a three-place grid penalty after he launched uh, Alonso into lower orbit in Texas, and Magnuson changed some power unit components. Uh, so he had a five-place drop for the race. Then we got to the race start. The the black the the bags we call them, the the blankets come off of the the black and round things. Uh, what do we notice? Red Bull soft. Yeah, Mercedes medium. Well, not split strategies, but different sort of strategies throughout the teams at the start. And this is where my excitement first started Ooh. building. I thought, oh, here we go. This is going to be a good go one. On, Good lad. So yeah, we had the Red Bulls on softs and the Mercs on mediums. Medium, mediums. I didn't even fucking pay attention to what Ferrari were on because I think they <laughs> no, they're they're in quite the fucking... early on this was going to be painful for them. <laughs> they're in the they, they Ferrari are where Mercedes have been most of the season in no man's land. Yeah, so they could have been on wets for all I know. I didn't really pay a huge amount of attention. Oh, but someone just mentioned this in the chat before we had the. Uh, the race start we had the mexican f1 theme music. oh the mariachi theme it was so good oh it was spectacular if you haven't heard it yeah. look it look it up because uh that Big was fan. that was magnificent so yeah, i did enjoy that we so i mean we're just before we've even left the grid as soon as the, the covers come off we're like oh okay uh we get to the race start 
everybody's got a reasonable ish start uh hamilton gains a spot and and i'm really disappointed in george russell he yeah well, he dropped back two places was it it's not that he dropped back two places it's that he didn't dive bomb anybody well no there was no terrorism no exactly he, he said he was gonna dial down the terrorism i believe yeah. in one the, of his interviews defcon 4 on the uh, terror level but yeah he's he's moved on to hearts and minds operation hearts <laughs> and minds now did you see his uh his line in the press he's like if it was anybody except for hamilton i would have run them off the track yeah. i was like go on lad he's not hiding yeah. anything he is true to himself his stare frightens me but you know what i was like i was Good like for you george the, the you're in an f1 car and i'm not so yeah exactly fucking get in there um Stroll had a stinker of a start again. He's been doing really, really good on race starts and restarts. Stroll up five. Um, Sunoda Albon yeah. and Fettel up two as well. So this thing with Stroll, I think this is what I was referencing to the other week. Ooh. Stroll has these moments, right, where he does things like this. Like he'll make up five places at the start or whatever. And then I'll turn around and say, you know what? Stroll's actually not that bad of a driver. But then he'll have a complete bozo moment like we saw in Austin where he went into low orbit or sent Alonso into low yeah. orbit. And then you think, oh, yeah, that's Stroll, yeah. Yeah. He's I mean, so inconsistent. He balances out, man. I think he's balancing out. So, yeah, anyway. <laughs> um, And after the race start, like, we're just watching Hamilton on the back of Max. Uh, we're watching... Uh, Russell following Perez and, and then Ferrari kind of disappear off the back of that train. Um, and it's kind of a four group race at this point. We've got Red Bull and Mercedes who are racing each other on merit, albeit on different strategies, uh, which is interesting. We've got Ferrari by themselves, completely by themselves. We've got everybody else. And then we've got Nicholas Latifi. Uh, after his first stop, he does not rejoin uh, the pack and he finishes two laps down so we don't need to speak of him again he's had a terrible weekend unfortunately for the lad but the front of the race is the most interesting when there's a there's a bunch of stuff happening in the back and i will get back to that the front of the race is the most interesting though because we're looking at this i'm looking at this and i'm thinking red bull soft mercedes medium red bull two stop mercedes might yeah have it with the one stop and effectively mercedes on one step harder compound can match the red bull pace they don't have a chance at overtaking or attacking them but they can match and they can stay close but what's what's the strategy we don't know yet well no but i i was the same opinion of you as soon as i saw uh the bullies the bullies that's what i'm going to call them now the bullies on um the softs I thought, oh, okay, it's going to be a medium and a soft strap. Um, but then Mercedes, uh, they came off, well, obviously Red Bull pitted first on the mediums. Yeah, Perez out, kicked out that, of that off group on yeah. like lap like 23 or something. Um, and then when I saw the Mercedes go onto the hards, I thought, oh, they've, they've, they've done Red Bull here because there's no way they're going to get those mediums to the end. No. And uh, what happened? They got the mediums to the end, but still, yeah. yeah, it was, this was the most exciting part of the race for me, seeing how these alternative strategies sort of played out. Yeah. yeah. Then at the same time, that's also what killed the race because it turns out you probably could have put the wets on and just gone to the end of the race anyway. Yeah. Like F1 manager, uh, beta F1 manager strat, you know, <sighs> but yeah. it's, it's weird. Cause like, here's, here's my take on this though. Like the interesting thing is when you have a weekend like this or a sprint weekend, Okay, sprint weekend is different because you get two races and you get to do a long stint, you know, like a, a third stint of a race on a certain tire and you get to learn about that tire. But you remove the track time, nobody did any meaningful running on a hard and nobody did any particularly meaningful high fuel running, in my opinion. Like they're extrapolating it, strategists are reaching, they're they're pooling resources, they're pooling numbers from other tracks, other races this year. Um, and it leaves a lot of uncertainty. So my take is Mercedes did not have the confidence that uh, soft, medium, medium was fast, and they didn't have the confidence that they could do a soft, medium, one stop. They said, you know what? We think the Red Bull are going to go for the fast strat. Why don't we go medium hard and make it work? And there's a couple of reasons, and I'm working on a video on that on Break F1 
should have it out Wednesday on digging into the details. But we're gonna give, we're gonna give you guys a little teaser here. And we're gonna talk about it. Yeah, and one of the things that you mentioned during your live lot bloody hell, live watch along, which I thought was quite interesting, is that it wasn't necessarily the degradation of the tires that was the issue, but it was the temperature window they were in. Could you explain a bit more for idiots like me? So, yeah, I mean, t typically, and it's not a linear scale, your softer tires work at cooler temperatures and your harder tires. Um, I've just had a huge brain fart because my cat's meowing outside. Well, <laughs> so the, the softer tires can't get as hot and the harder tires basically um, need more energy to keep them working. And that's that's one of the big things. So the harder the tire is, the slower your pace, and the window might be lower or higher. That... Sorry, the window. Sorry, the window might be higher. I've just had a huge brain. So the window might be higher. So for example, what we saw during the race was you even heard Max talking to his race engineer about ways to put more energy into the tires, and you don't have to worry about saving the tires. You can push now to keep them working. Lewis on the hard was struggling massively. Uh, and you look at his lap times that, you know, he did have to come through traffic, but when he'd go through traffic, he'd lose a lot of performance. Um, and he just couldn't get those tires in the window to work well. Did you think that is, is that related to the atmospheric conditions that we get in Mexico or is that just a misomena? No, I mean that, that, the, the, that will impact the convection or transfer of temperature from the surface of the tire to the air. But this, the, the, the overriding thing was putting enough stress in the tire to keep it going. Okay. So do you think for next year, maybe Pirelli are going to go a step softer? Possibly. But this, you know, or, or do you think they should have? I, it was interesting. It just wasn't very good racing because Ferrari turned their car down so much and then the rest of the field were so shit. Yeah. In regards to Ferrari as well. Sorry, I'm jumping about here. No, no. Did you That's see fine. the end? There was a photo of the engine cover after Friday, and it was all bubbling and and paint no. off where it was overheating. No, I didn't see that. The yeah. cool, some of the coolers were getting nuked. Yes, it did look Ooh. very toasty. But yeah, I just had a huge brain fart talking about tires. There, it's been a long week. But the, yeah. one of the one of the main issues with the harder compounds was keeping enough energy in them to keep the tire in the window. If you back off, uh, and they talked a lot about lifting and coasting, which is at the end of the straight, you're lifting off the throttle. And waiting, you know, 25, 50 meters before attacking the brake pedal. That saves fuel. It's a good way to go fast for a race strategy. Unfortunately, you lose a lot of tires and brake temperature as a result of that. So, um, yeah, yeah. And, and if they brought one step softer, that would have made it more interesting. But then possibly you would see nobody running the soft. So, so it's, it's like you, 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 no matter what they do, you, there's, a, there's going to be a suboptimal tire. So have you looked... You probably have, because I know this is you, but the stint times for Max on the medium yeah. were or every single one of his times in what? The 122s. 35 laps, yeah. Is, were yeah. All 122s apart from the VSC lap. So basically, the more laps you do on a tire, it's losing a little bit of performance, but as you do more laps, you're burning fuel, so the tire degradation was matching um, the fuel effect and um, super consistent. And the medium, he was able to keep it in the window uh, and Lewis was just struggling on that hard tire. You could see the inconsistency in his lap times, not an indication of him driving poorly, but an indication of him trying different things to try and get the hard tire in the window. Mm. Max's fuel and tire wear were in equilibrium. Yes. Do you like oh, that? Nice that was a big word there. Did you stroke the beard when you say that again? Just equilibrium. Equilibrium. It's yeah. the name of my new fragrance that's coming out. Oh, goodness. It smells like cigarettes and stale coffee and disappointment <laughs> and you can buy it from poundland <laughs> yeah it's christmas oh you're gonna get maddie to uh market it for you as well yeah maybe so um i flipped that whole thing on its head and called will buxton a waitrose matt gallagher <laughs> oh i love it i love it so there you go i'm i'm working my way to get blocked by every single sort of personality and journalist on the grid to be fair the pre-orders for that fragrance are already come in i can see them coming through right now on the live stream so that's pretty impressive but yeah um 
so like realistically that's kind of the crux of the race russell at one point was like let me stay out on these mediums and i'll go to the soft to the end but realistically russell's pace was not good enough um and he was he was quite a f far way behind that it wasn't going to impact his race to to, to checko i don't think the longer you stay out on that medium he was losing pace to the red bulls on new mediums at a decent rate so I don't think that was going to work and his pit wall said it wasn't going to work and honestly at this point by starting on the medium they had made their bed that that was their race they, they mm. played their hand from the race start and that's the unfortunate thing about a one stop and they find out you know what it is going to be a one stop and that's a one stop yeah not, not they particularly fucked exciting. around and found out yeah exactly but like people are people like i saw a lot of merc fans calling for the heads of the strategists and it's like cool well, I, I don't think they were going to beat Red Bull on the same strategy, so maybe maybe Red Bull got their tire figures wrong and they couldn't do the one stop. Or I didn't even know if they planned the one stop, but it's, it's one of, it was one of those fuck around and find out. And if you can get to lap twenty five or so, you might be in the window. Yeah. So, so there we go. Our really super exciting strategy battle didn't really turn out too much, did it? Really? Yeah. No, yeah, exactly. Um, Ferrari, like you say, they were in a world of their own. Yeah. Christ, well, that was that was painful for them this weekend. Tifosi, I know you're out there and you listen, sending you thoughts and prayers. They were ripping um, into, you know, Team Carlos was ripping into Team Team Leclerc it, back and forth. It was it's bad. Descended I'm, into civil war. Yeah, exactly. It's like well, there's nobody else to be mad at. Let's be mad at each other. Fuck them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <sighs> That result for Ferrari and Mercedes now brings Mercedes to within 40 points of P2 in the Constructors' Championship. Oh, oh Two blimey. races to go, crikey. Two races to go, a 40-point gap, Brazil and Abu Dhabi. Do you see the possibility that Merck might jump Ferrari for P2? Um... Anything's possible. I mean, Benato said there's no reason they can't win the last 10 races of the season a while back. Um, that was wishful thinking. And somebody, that was a paid acting job. I don't think uh, they didn't get their money's worth out of that. Uh, no. But uh, I think it's possible. I think it's unlikely, but I think it's very possible. To make the rest of this season exciting for me, I'm going to say yes. Okay. I'd like to see right. it. Honestly, but I'd I like need, to see it. I need Mercedes to jump Ferrari to P2 without winning a race yeah keep oh, the beard because then i'll lose the beard so that's that's my excitement for the next two races okay put some put some skin in the game i like that yeah. but yeah i, I to, to close the loop on the mercedes thing though i think if they match the strategy with red bull they would have not unless they got an overtake on track they wouldn't have been able to overtake them i, I just don't see it from the numbers and the single lap performance and the, what we saw of the long on performance but yeah um ferrari no man's land Let's get into the, some of the midfield shithousery because there was a lot of it. Go on, Bennett. Right. Yeah. What, what do you think of this one? Uh, Gasly dive bomb. Well, he, it wasn't really a dive bomb. He did lock up and he lost control. He went so wide that he forced Stroll off and Gasly himself could not stay on the track. So if you're, yeah. if you're that team and you know that you've pushed a car off track and you've gone off track yourself as a result of a misjudgment of the braking zone or lock up, these things happen. Do you hold on to the position and wait for the penalty because it's fucking coming or do you uh just hold the position and uh yeah or do you get back yeah why so why did they not give that back what the fuck was that glad you asked that now i do have to go back and double check this so okay. people out there may already know and they can shout down the radio that i'm wrong but i think there was a car just behind stroll that was also racing them for position so if Gasly let Stroll pass, there was a big chance that that car was also going to jump him. Ooh, that could be wrong. It could have been a blue flagged car, uh, blue flagged car, but I thought there was a car behind him that got right up to them that was possibly going to jump him Ooh, if oh, Gasly I, gave that back. I can't see it immediately. No, so I could be wrong. Could be wrong. Okay. Um, but if that's the case, then I I can't um. Sorry, if that's the case, then I completely understand why he didn't give it back. I'd just take the fucking penalty later on rather yeah, might, than risk it, dropping two places. It might have been Albon, apparently, but... I don't know. 
Yeah, I don't Maybe. remember that at all. But anyway, but yeah. In like, terms but... of the maneuver where he he pushed him off, uh, I decided to add to the toxicity of Twitter, and I said, "Oh, look, Gasly's taken the playbook of Max Verstappen there." That was fucking cl- You're so biased, Dan. I know. How dare you? How dare you? And he hanged. <laughs> but but he he got a five second penalty for that, and I think that's fair. Like. He didn't cause any damage. He didn't DNF anyone. Uh, for example, Russell on his uh, latest attack in Austin got 10 seconds for signs, wasn't it? Or is that not the case? Uh, no. Russell got five seconds, didn't he? Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Russell okay, got it... five seconds for taking Carlos out in the US Grand Prix. Yeah. Sorry, is this what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah and then Danny Rick got 10 seconds for trying to say. Send... Ah, okay. We'll, we'll come to that one in a second. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, I guess so it... in, sorry. In regards to Gasly, uh, I think it's all it's all fair. I, yep. I think Gasly would probably be the first to say that he lost control at that point. Um, what do you think and... George Russell would have said? Oh, he would have been like, um, "Hang on, hang on. I haven't set up my uh, soundboard. Give it a sec." He'd have said, "Call blimey, governor! He was all up in my chuff." <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Um, he turned into me, yeah, because you yeah. were going straight all the way to the outside of turn five, mate. Cool, he was right in my postcode. So yeah. Uh, oh, I love that. So uh, I think I think that was fair. I think that was fair. He needs to be careful now, though, doesn't he? Because two penalty points until a race ban, I believe. Yeah, I think Gasly is just tired of the season, and just wants that race ban. Yeah, it'd so. be a good way to sit out, and it's a good way to get you know call uh, young liam up get liam some seat time yeah i think gasly needs to go uh do some wild shit in brazil so that he can uh take an early off season yeah but to be fair that that goes all the way into the start of next season i believe uh someone in the points. chat is telling me that his first penalty points will be gone in may 2023 so he even has to be careful at the start mm. of next year mm. let's let's talk on some next stuff because we've we've had a I was happy during this race at one point when I saw Danny Rick. We're getting some peak Honey Badger back a little bit. That was a good drive from him, honestly. Very good drive. It was... So I... This isn't a dig at Danny Rick. I'll just put that Better in not. Front. Better not. I'll tag... I'll at all of his ex-girlfriends on Twitter that it... Oh, okay. I won't um, do that. Oh, you, you always do this. You throw me right off. What was I saying? <laughs> Yeah, this was a real Jekyll and Hyde performance from him, right? Because he absolutely bashed into Yuki, right? And people say, oh, well, Yuki shut the door on him. Whatever. Fine. But he gets a penalty from that. And then he just sort of realizes, oh, fuck, I'm Danny Rick. Puts some softs on and just goes mental and wins driver of the day. I was just like, what is going on? It's like, yeah, mate, you need to make up 10 seconds because you've just sent Tsunoda into the shadow realm. Oh, my God. Punched a hole in the side of that car, knocked him off, and then he goes for it. And there's a video floating around of him giving the finger guns when he overtakes. Yes, and I still I haven't freaking that, yeah. seen it, man. But um, yeah. he goes on to manage clearing Ocon by 10 seconds. So he holds on to P7, I believe. Yeah, so he finished P7, got a 10 second penalty, remained P7. So good job, Danny Rick. That's that's Go one on. of your brighter performances recently. Go on, lad. Um, but yeah. was this, again, so this strong performance one from him, right? And I'm going to get the old tin foil out, everyone, get ready. Go on. Did he get a strong performance out of this because he overrode the strategy and said, no, I'm doing medium soft? Because in the past, and I can't verify this. I've been told this by Daniel Ricardo stands. So who knows how accurate this is? But a lot of the time, apparently, Danny Rick will ask for a different strategy and get denied. Yeah. Maybe, maybe he did. He feel in control again, t- channeling his inner Carlos Sainz or uh, George Russell. I mean, he definitely, he, he, said... he, he definitely channeled some George Russell energy in that one. Jesus. Yeah, maybe he just said, well, I'm out at the end of the season. I'm just not going to fucking come in and I'm just going to do my own strategy. But yeah. Yeah, fine. Yeah, fine. Um, So whatever, fine. It worked for him. Um, Yeah. What else you got? So around lap 52, Alonso starts giving it all the beans. And you could tell he's leaving. He's leaving that team at the end of the season. But he's not happy because his engine is 
bleeding performance. He goes from being on pace with the Ferraris to getting devoured by the rest of the midfield. I mean, he's 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 over 25 seconds behind the Ferraris, but he's matching them in pace. And he's not doing too badly, honestly. Um, and then his engine starts dying. And then he's coming into, I believe it's turn one. And the thing grenades itself, and he's so unhappy. I reckon he was so pissed off that it was shitting itself that he just pulled the clutch and revved it to shit. Yes, I, I also like this theory that he's um, absolutely gone mental with it. Um, but I, I was thinking again, me thinking is a dangerous combination. But I was thinking, is Ferrari's strategic fuck up um, throughout the year and ongoing issues covering up for the fact that Alpine have got an absolute dog of a car in terms of reliability this year? I mean, if we weren't talking about Ferrari, we'd be talking about Alpine for sure. Yeah, 100%. that's that, that's that's my theory. Hmm. No, it's it's not fun, but uh, uh the Alonso um, and Hamilton. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say that all the way uh, for all four Alpine fans out there. Oof. No, but it's it's it. I think everybody knows that, and it's it's the the Renault's not a particularly reliable engine. It's not. It's just a fucking fact. It's not like that slander. Never, never has been. No, right, but at least it's fast now. It's fast but unreliable. Before it was oh. shit but unreliable. Progress. Woo! Exactly. Exactly. But, um, yeah, what about all the Alonzo? I don't want to get into it too deep, but Alonzo and uh, Hamilton giving each other shit all week, and that's getting super petty. But the social media war of um, 2022. I just enjoyed it. I thought it was quite funny. Um, I think Alonzo enjoys taking little digs at Hamilton and... Yeah, this it, time you got a response in terms of a thumbs up, which I thought was brilliant from Lewis. Yeah, fucking good um, in Lewis. Clap, yeah, he clapped just, back. And he yeah, clapped back. I just, I just think it's funny between them. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Alonso someone, seems very petty, doesn't he? He he's he has got a chip on his shoulder, but he doesn't need to be because Alonso is a good driver. Yeah. Even now, when he's older, or more elderly, shall we say? Alonso is a far better driver now than, let's say, I don't know, Kimi Raikkonen was in his last two years. Yeah. Kimi retired two years too late, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah. Whereas Alonso, I've not seen anything from him that would say, actually, Alonso, you've been here too long. No. Uh, but he is getting beat by Arcon this season. Because Alonso's car keeps exploding. Don't, Every... I don't make up, don't bring in the facts to this discussion. My feelings can't take it. Listen, I'm not. I'm not saying it's conspiracy theory or whatever. It's just facts. Alonso's car has been far more unreliable than Ocon's. I'm so, not going to argue with that. I just wanted to say that to stir the pot. Yeah, well, you're a wanker. So, <laughs> oh, what else we got in the race? Um, Latifi two laps behind. I don't want to say anything else about that. Aston and Haas looked. Completely Ask. nowhere this weekend, just like fucking nowhere. And I don't even want to go on about it because I feel bad for them, honestly. But they're so inconsistent in terms of performance and it sucks to see it because I would like to see more teams establishing the pecking order and chasing each other instead of being flip-flop every freaking weekend. I even put a graphic on Twitter of their uh, qualifying performances all season and it's just like, what what's going on? There's some fundamental issues that they have not come to grips with that car or the operation of that car. Mm, yeah rough yeah rough then for them. russell uh oh, bottas converts a p6 in qualifying to a p10 result uh strong single lap pace but uh just really couldn't hang on to that really could he no he couldn't no no that's um, all right i mean I th it looks like he went super long on his first stint um and then just got it just didn't work out um no i, I don't know what else i would have done differently because if he had gone short on that he would have been stuck in a gaggle of cars going the same length as he had before so a bit unlucky but not enough pace to break out of that uh vicious cycle of getting stuck in the uh death traps there no and we forgot i think i forgot to say about this earlier um but bottas out qualifying charles leclerc oh he split the ferraris didn't he yeah yeah Boom. bang bottas is back mr saturday the yeah. original go on lad go on yeah that was pretty good um, Russell pops in 
the blimey fastest purple monster at the end? Yep, he does. Yep. After he'd been asking to go onto softs for ages, and they're like, "All right, now at the end, lad, go on." Yeah, he was like, "Oh, these times I've got a puncher, honest, governor." Oh, he was milking that. He's like, "Please have yeah. a puncher. Please have a puncher." I just drove through. He did. This fucker deliberately drove through the debris that he found on the track just to get off of those shit hards. Yeah, and and then eventually he got his wish um, to pop on some softs for the fastest yeah. lap at the Go end. On, Such was the gap between uh, him and Signs, I believe. Yeah, that yeah, he, he could do that with no punishment. So yeah, I mean, but if he had, um, if they had had a shit stop, he would have been eaten up by Signs. Well, speaking of shit stops, we did have a shit stop this week, didn't we? Uh, Checo, Ooh. poor old Checo Perez. Oh yeah, that... uh, got was it front left? I can't remember front left or front right. Yeah, I, that didn't a really bit of a. I say I... a shit stop. I think it was five seconds, but that is shit when yeah. you, when it comes to Red Bull. I mean, he, at that rate, he would have still fallen behind uh, Leclerc. But you know, that's if he had had a better stop, he would have actually ended up ahead of Hamilton when Hamilton stopped. Mm. That's that's how that went basically. Uh, McLaren yeah. set a record for the season, 1.9 second stop on the 18-inch uh, bad boys. Yes, they did. A 1.98, I'll have you know. Oof, oof, go on, lads. Fastest of the season. Uh, I think Jonathan Wheatley's like, we got to take that, boys. They're, yeah, they're, yeah. they're grinding oh, for that stop. He won't be happy. He no. will not be happy about that. Red Bull have been spectacular pit stops, but it's cool seeing McLaren smash in some competition. Get in right up there. Go on, lad. Um... Let's wrap it up. So, the like I don't really care about the results of this race. It was interesting-ish. It was just like one of the... I just got blue-balled the whole race. I'm like, is it a one-stop or not? And then as soon as it was clear as a one-stop, I'm just like... Oh, great, I'm glad yeah. it's over. But... I, I fed some of the delusion on Twitter as well by good. saying that this is definitely going to be... Red Bull definitely going to have to pit again. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then they didn't. So, yet again, I look like a fucking idiot on social media. It's fine. 70. But I advertise the fact that I am, so if you believe me, that's your own fucking hey, fault. Hey, dumbasses. Shitbags. But, um, Max Verstappen sets a couple records. What does he set? What records does he smash out of the park, Blake? So, seven Michaels, 13 wins in a season. He surpassed it on to 14, uh, and he has scored the most points in a season. But I do believe he will be the first to say that it's, not, it's not as difficult as it used to be, because there's a lot more races. But if not, but like you know, if you, if you cut cut out the first part of the season, you know the first couple of races, and say right, there's a season starting at race four or five. It's pretty impressive. Still, it's not unimpressive at all. No, if you look at his fourteen wins up till now, and you work out the percentage, I think it equals or is very very close in terms of percentages to Michael's thirteen in the okay. season he did it in. So if you look at it that way. I think they're very close. Yeah, I think he's going to do it. He's going to get another win this season. Has to. Yeah. There's, two, there's two chances, and both those tracks will go well for the Red Bulls. Like, none of the tracks go badly for the Red Bulls right now. No, that's true. Very true. Well, I think I think that was the race, really, wasn't it, really? Everyone was shit, apart from Red Bull and Mercedes. Yeah. And Mercedes were let down, possibly, by strategy, so... Uh, GG's that was the Mexico Grand Prix yeah um, if you fell asleep during it I, I don't really blame you I think the only thing that kept me going was the possible strategy yeah that was uh, the only thing but I will say this I'm going to do a little plug here watching oh, here we go. watching here the we stream go. with you you were there too you fucker watching the stream live on Twitch with everybody is actually a lot of fun hanging out and talking me, me I have a, I get a lot of enjoyment of talking about the race and what's going on with you guys and looking at the uh, the timing having the conversations, you know, trying to listen to a couple different drivers, radio messages, um, and try to take some context and put like frame what's happening in the race. Cause some of the messages are a little bit cryptic sometimes, but, um, that's super fun. So if you're into that every Saturday and Sunday before qualifying and before the race, twitch.tv front slash break with three hours. And, uh, we have a blast. Everybody in the chat saying they had a great time. And everything is more fun with friends. Oh yeah. Especially, including uh, camping at Le Mans. Yeah. <laughs> with, with Dr. Marco. Uh, oh, I love it. Right, is it that time? Hit it. Fraud Watch. Fraud Watch. 
Thank you, Michael Kiss. That is so fucking beautiful. So, Dan, yeah. this is the part of the show where you and I both nominate somebody for Fraud Watch. And uh, let's, uh, let's, let's yeah, get we, into it. We pick a bad thing. Bad, bad thing from the week. And if you're in the stream, I want to see your nominations for Fraud Watch as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you're on YouTube watching this, I want to see your nominations. And if you're listening to this on a uh podcast platform like spotify or apple music go ahead and leave us a review and hit that five star right now yeah and if you're listening to this on the car on the way to work just wind your window down and just shout it out to someone as you drive yeah. past them yeah right now yeah they all, right. they all know they all listen they'll, they'll understand they'll be like oh that's his nomination for forward watch I, I will say this when i was in austin i got to talk to a bunch of homies and the number of people that i've known or I don't know, and they know of the podcast in the paddock who came up to me. He's like, dude, I love your podcast with Dan. I was like, it's nice to meet you. Hey, I'm Blake. Nice to meet you. I was like, I was fucking blown away. There was, you know, it wasn't like hundreds, but it was, there was probably five to 10 people over the weekend. They're like, love your podcast, dude. People that I know. That there I are didn't literally know. dozens of us. Yeah. They're literally 10 12 to 12 people that listen to this podcast. Wow. It's opening doors. Listen, next year we'll be on the grid. Uh, Lamar fraudcast mm. so who's on fraud watch Sorry, for you this fraud week watch, yeah so fraud watch right so technically right my first fraud watch is like my unofficial fraud watch ah. and that's me for forgetting to do this for the last two weeks running um but i was ill and i was high on cold and flu medication and we that's, did have some very very excellent guests as well yeah so that's that's my excuse i'm sticking to it um my actual uh, fraud watch is Christian Horner for putting on s spectacled glasses during his cost cap conference. Oh, he needed that, that IQ boost. Right. He Listen, I have worked at Red Bull for six years. I've never seen him wear glasses once. Maybe, Not once. Are you being ageist, bro? No, I've just never seen him wear glasses. Me neither. I, Me I, neither. Don't, I don't think this is a real thing. I think this is a, this is fake spectacles to make him seem smart. <laughs> and, we've, and trust, we've talked trustable. to our study groups and they say yeah. that spectacles are plus two points in likability and um i'm not gonna say it never mind anyway, yeah so anyway the 1000 iq glasses that i've never ever seen him wear before fraud watch <laughs> christian i'm on to you go on lad go on lad fair enough um so my my fraud of the week my fraud watch has something to do with ted kravitz you know he's been making some weird oh this could go either way he, he's been making some weird accusations and and towing some interesting lines but you're allowed to have an opinion and anybody sending ted kravitz shit messages on social media because you don't agree with him you're a fucking dork get a life seriously anybody that's harassing people on twitter or social media because they don't like your take on something fuck yourself man seriously touch grass but um ted you're crazy i don't agree with you all the time but nobody deserves that no matter what so if everybody agreed with each other it would be boring yeah but you don't have to be a cunt either no so that's us out yeah oh, shit i am a cunt anyway um we don't have what we don't have an engine mode good boy sound yet i think michael's working on but michael got us this this week this was good so i told the story earlier so uh michael who did you know our intro and he did all that um he was like i was looking at your uh, data analysis thing on buy me a coffee and uh, i got this phone call from my credit card and it goes something like this fraud alert break f1 analysis suspicious activity <laughs> that's us baby uh, so i mean that's that's pretty that's actually hilarious and entirely on brand uh but this is the engine mode good boy where we nominate somebody for doing a great job someone or something for doing a great job this weekend yeah go on lad yeah my engine mode good boy uh i'm going to give it to the mclaren pit stop crew for that first sub two second pit stop of the year at one love 1. that nine eight seconds well done lads well done very good very excellent uh that's awesome that's gonna be a tough one to beat this season what's the second fastest it's close to two uh you know what i don't even know well we'll, we'll have to look at it and we'll touch back on this next week so uh yeah I, I've got, um, no, I was going to say, so I was going to give Russell my fraud watch, honestly, because he didn't terrorize anyone this week, but I, I've already done my fraud watch and that's any people being assholes. 
Uh, my engine mode good boy this week is Ricky Bobby. I like seeing him smile, man. I miss yeah. I miss Honey Badger. I'm I hate to see that he's not in a car next season. He's had a tough season, um, but yeah, man. The he's engine being touted for a, a reserve role, though, isn't he? Yeah, Somewhere, but that's maybe. That's just not any fun. That's basically no, sitting in. That's that's you end up in a paddock and you end up doing some sim work. Probably. I mean, I'd, I, I'd fucking do it. I'd fucking do it. But, I mean, to be to be fair, Alex, when he took a year out and was doing sim work, um, he's just a fucking good kid, though. I've got so much time for Albon. I actually saw him in the hotel in uh, Austin. That was really nice. And I was like, uh, who, yeah. who's, who's this blonde? Did he dude? recognize who you were? Of course he did. I uh, worked with see, him. I'm just checking. Just I checking. worked with him like probably 30 weeks last year, so he better remember me, the dork. But yeah, he's a super nice dude, and uh, he, he he's got good work ethic and a uh, a good mental game for having a tough time. He kept his head on his shoulders. He's got a great drive. Alex is Alex is top dude. True that. True that. So uh, uh, somebody else in the chat has given their nomination. And I'm going to shout it out because it is also a very good one, and that's. Uh, Papa Perez and Anthony Hamilton. Yo, he's their like, little please. bromance they had going on this weekend. <laughs> Anthony's like, please don't kiss me again. Please don't kiss me again. <laughs> yeah, that, that was nice. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan. So, um, are we gonna are we gonna wrap this one up tidy? Like an hour and twenty seven episode, not bad, hey? Yeah, I think that I think that's on 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 limit for us, isn't it? Yeah. Do we normally say one hour thirty? Yeah, it's the limit. Uh, I'm recording another pod after this, and I'll put that on Twitter. So if anybody's not following Break on Twitter or Engine Mode mm. 11 on Twitter, um, that's a good way to keep in touch with us. Anytime anything exciting's happening, uh, we'll put it there. Yeah, and as part of the um, Red Bull agreed breach agreement, we have to cut down our podcast by 10% for 12 months anyway. So Yeah, yeah. and uh, by doing that, I'm just going to we'll reduce next week's stream by 10%. So we'll be still like an hour 15. It's fine. You guys will get all the fraudulent content that you want. So, uh, can you guys do me a favor and, uh, go fuck yourselves? No, I'm just kidding. Have a great night. Fuck off. <laughs>